All right, 1302, um, let's get to it. This is a blue book exam number two. We're going to be covering chapters 19 through 22. And um, these instructions really haven't changed all that much. We're basically looking at the same thing. Um, normal operating procedure is you, having you, um, the student, look at each question, break them into their parts. Um, you're going to use key terms. Um, you're going to utilize statistics as best you can, as you would have gotten from the textbook and um, the lecture notes and even some of the videos and then you also want to apply the W's all right and of course you're you're looking at that target length of 12 to 15 sentences 12 to 15 sentences that's what's going to drive a good response and you're looking at probably um, about five sentences each paragraph because again when you're looking at breaking things into parts most of your questions um, you're looking at a roughly at least three major parts that you're going to be talking about. All right. Um, you're going to apply the W's, um, who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and that's, a, again, that's a redundant theme through all your exams to date. And again, you can't go wrong because you want to master not only what you're saying, but how you're saying it. And here's a format that um, I gave you. Um, again, take each question. Try to find, if I haven't provided for you, three major things you want to talk about. And then go ahead and break it up into stanzas. A stanza A, a stanza B, and a stanza C. Um, and again, you want to use terms, concepts, and generalizations. And use them um, as much as possible and as they apply. And again, that's a lot of, a lot, the, due to the fact it's coming from your notes and you have access to those, um, there's just a, just a plenty of information that you have um, access to, um, to utilize. All right, so let's um, take a look at the first question. Um, and let's see what we got here. Um... Okay, question number one. Now, again, this part, what you're looking at, is the reluctancy. That, that's what you want to look at. And when you look at this, the key term that should come to mind is isolationism. All right. And this isolationism is historic. And you want to talk about George Washington's warning, uh, warning to the um, people and his farewell. You um, want to talk about the Monroe Doctrine. And you also want to talk about that there's no historical Precedent. In other words, we really don't um, have a history of getting involved in Europe. Um, yeah, maybe we had some skirmishes on the seas, but to actually go to the European continent and do something, um, it hasn't been a part of our history. So that's, that's two major things you can talk about. Now, when you talk about economics, what you want to talk about is... United States industry is looking good and we're exporting a good deal and the last thing that we want to do is turn around and muddy the waters in other words we have good relations with Great Britain we have good relations with France we have good relations with Germany and um, profits are up and obviously you want to definitely talk about what we sent them in relation to goods so if you say to me we're selling a lot of stuff to them okay I get that but what you really need to do is tell me what we're selling them all right um, metals food um, textiles lumber all of that stuff all right and it's all this stuff 
that keeps coming back to this right here, the reluctance. All right. So let's take um, a look at the next question. Now, when you get to this question, what you're looking at is the fact that the United States slowly but surely starts to devise an attitude and this attitude is largely in support of Western civilization, right? And encouraged by the British, we slowly but surely start to shift our attentions towards shaping public opinion. This is especially by the time we get to 1915, 1916, and what we're going to establish is something called CPI and that is going to end up being under the direction of Keel, Creel, excuse me. And what we want to do is we want to get public opinion on the side of government decisions. And again, even though we're reluctant, we're trying to shape that reluctance. All right, we're trying to shape it because we know now there's a good chance we're going to end up um, going into um, the war on behalf of the, the allies, the Western powers. Now, another thing you want to talk about, you're talking about the shaping. Now what you want to do is what civil liberties were threatened. And here, what you want to do is you want to mention Wilson. You want to mention the Red Scare you want to re mention that they're willing to take away certain liberties and you want to definitely tell me what the liberties are freedom of the press freedom of speech freedom of assembly and again these things are there because we don't want anarchists to get a foothold in our country and, and toward anything that we're, we're moving for, towards, all right? And, that, and that's key. And it's really nothing that we're not gonna do. Um, once again, um, when we get to um, World War II, all right? So this is definitely nothing new, all right? Um, let's take a look at the third question and here what you have is what impact did the war have on minority populations in the United States and first thing you want to do here is you definitely want to talk about the war then you want to talk about the role of women in the war and then the minorities in the workplace all right so with regards to war, you talk about manpower and you know that the men went off to fight it. And what that does is it now provides a segue to why women now serve and minorities um, now serve. Now, what you basically have is women are now going to assume the role of head of household. They are going to assume the money role and it's in large numbers, all right? And this in many ways is gonna provide independence for women, right? Um, and that's something that they really haven't had before. Now with minorities, it's gonna trigger the great migration and this is especially true with African Americans from the South who venture northwards um, to assume industry jobs. And again, with this, this brings financial independence, um, some social independence, and it also provides a pathway to leave the Jim Crow South, 
I, it's it's a financial incentive to leave this uh, Jim Crow South, all right? And here, you could also talk about how um, Mexican immigration um, would have gone up. And again, that's because in the, in the Southwest and the Midwest, um, they needed migrant workers um, to um, pick food out of the fields, all right? So there's just all of this. Now, one thing you want to do at the end of this is you want to talk about what happens in post-1918 America, all right? And that's key because if you don't talk about it, um, you are going to end up having me ask, well, what happened after the war, all right? So here it is. The war ends, um, and now what you have is... Um, returning veterans want their jobs back and this um, for all practical purposes leads to racial violence all right not only in the north but also in the south again all of this is just post 1918 America so that's pretty much question three in a nutshell all right, let's take a look at that last one. Um, here, what you basically have is you are looking at Wilson. You are looking at 1919 Paris. Wilson is seen as a hero. Um, he proposes his 14 points. And what this is, is not 14 points in favor of America. This is 14 points in favor of world peace and a new world order. And what I encourage you to do is talk, just give us a brief overview of these 14 points just just look it up real quick and just tell me what some of these are now again the key here is you're dealing with hopes you're dealing with this now what you basically have is he goes to Europe he's amongst a, of a group of leaders called the big three and what it is is Great Britain France and United States are talking what is the future of the world now he's overly he's overconfident about what he can do um, European people love him but the leaders don't so that last part of it what you're going to do is look at arguments and you're going to give me the ones for and you're going to give me the ones against. Now, this first argument with regards to this, this 14 points, and then what you would eventually end up with is the treaty that creates the League of Nations, is you want to avoid future wars. You want to be able to give the world a place to debate. and argue without going to war, all right? And that's the avoidance. So you make a connection between avoiding future wars and you also talk about debate. You also talk about arguing um, avoidance of war. Um, you could talk about open markets and free seas. Um, this this idea of his is, is, is grand, um, it's super, um, but you also got to remember, um, it, it's just not widely accepted by everybody. Now, what would be the disadvantages or what would be the arguing against it is the fact that he's doing all this without talking to Congress. He's basically um, went behind their backs. He has the Republicans basically saying, no. We're not going to have you 
um, have foreign countries shape U.S. foreign policy. That, that's just too much control that you're now rendering to a foreign body. Okay. Um, and those are two, those are probably the two biggest things right there. You went behind our backs, and then now you want foreign powers have um, to be in the middle of um, foreign policy. Um, and if it's just not foreign policy, what's not to say that it won't be economic matters as well? All right, just. We, we don't want people stepping in the middle of our business. All right. So here you have it. This is um, question four. Um, you now have all of chapter 19 scripted for you. Um, and, and again, th there's plenty here for you on this one. All right. So let's take a look at the next one, um, chapter 20. And what you're looking at here is what contributed to the economic boom of the 1920s. Um, be sure to include a relationship between biz business and um, the 1920s. So obviously that first thing you want to do is you're going to talk about that economic boom. All right. And um, I don't want to say it's clear cut, but there's plenty of things we talked about in class that fuel all this. All right. So you can talk about the fact that we're an industrial power. We have farm markets, plenty of customers, right? We managed to stay out of World War I for the most part. But there was real no damage to our infrastructure like there was to Europe. So we, we just did not have infrastructure damage. All right. So our canals, our roads, our houses, our cities, our farms were basically untouched. You also have um, most Americans now have access to easy credit. And this is huge. Um, because now it's not so much what you make, it's access to money that allows you to continue to, um, consume. All right. Um, so consumerism is definitely up. All right. And the attitude about it is up. All right. And then there's a little bit of myth making here that everything is grand, all right? And that's just because um, nobody really sees um, anything wrong. And that economic boom and that last thing would be, is this right here. Advertising of goods. Where are they hearing all this stuff? On the radio and in the newspaper, all right? It's just, we're tapping into a, consu uh, a consumer who's basically having its attitudes about shopping um, shaped it, all right? Now that last part of it is when you talk about big business and government, they're, they're, they're running buddies. Um, what you have is you have the government supplying data or information about consumers. You have tariffs. You have markets. And again, this goes to three presidents that are basically saying hands off. All right. And this is key because it's this hands off that allows industry to pretty much go um, unabated, right? So you wanna mention that lacks oversight. In other words, we're gonna follow Adam Smith's dictum, um, 
goods and services sold for a profit based on capitalistic ideas, open markets, with little or no government interference. And again, all of this, all of this is done to support big business because big business is going to generate jobs, taxes, and profits. And in, in a lot of ways, big business is going to cre create consumerism or an attitude or uh, just, uh, I don't want to say myth, but just an attitude that everything is grand based on this consumption. All right. So this um, takes care of that first question. So let's... Um, Talk about number two. All right. Now, again, key here is you're looking at factors. All right. So real quick, what you want to do is you want to list things that you know um, you can talk about that would have helped with regards to all this. Now, the first thing would be technology. innovation, right? And this would have benefited uh, industry. You could talk about lax oversight. By the government. You can talk about immigration. Large numbers of people coming and what do they do? They provide cheap labor. Um, you can also talk about risk capital. In other words, people willing to risk money um, in, in inventions and um, businesses. You can also talk about the fact that you have the automobile. And this allows freedom of movement. In other words, I can now work in the city, but I can live in the burbs. All right. So you work in the city and then you live in the burbs, all right? Um, and again, all these can be used as factors. And just if you just took each one of these, you could easily, um, yeah, you could easily go a paragraph on each, all right? So that's the second one. And this one right here, um, basically the same thing. You're talking about systems. So what you're looking at is distribution markets or marketing, um, mass communication, and all of these are going to shape American culture and to some extent you can borrow a, a lot from the second answer second question that you have because there's a little bit of redundancy here all right now again systems of distri distribution marketing and mass communication now again with distribution you can talk about technology the railroad um, canals bridges um, the fact that our country's population is shifting. Here, marketing, you are definitely talking about ads. Um, you're talking about consumer ads where you have celebrities um, making commercials. You have the fact that goods are becoming cheaper, right? You're going to advertise using um, popular people. You have cheap goods, right? And you're going to shape their attitudes about how these goods are good for them. And again, this mass communication, you definitely, definitely, definitely want to talk about the radio and the fact that people um, are looking for um, popular entertainment in newspapers and uh, magazines, and they're going to use all this. Now, Again, you definitely want to look at shaping this answer in regards to talking about American culture. 
link it to consumerism. Link it to the standard of living going up. In other words, people have more time to spend. And you also want to link it to work hours going down. In other words, you have more time off from work. What are you going to do with that? You're going to turn around and um, spend it shopping or enjoying yourself. All right. And you could probably throw in movies in there as well um, as far as culture. All right. So let's talk about the culture wars. So here it is, question four, chapter 20. Now, what you definitely want to do here is identify forces almost immediately. Then you want to talk about culture. And in both of these, what you're looking for is you want to talk about how the liberals looked at it and then the conservatives looked at it. Now, these forces, what you can do is you could look at the fact that the nation is young. You can talk about the fact that we've just come out of a war and people want to be normal, free, and happy. And a lot of that, again, is that sense or that myth of the more the roaring 20s okay um you also have um industry where um a lot of people are working a lot of money is being made and again it's it's time it's tied to this freedom that i it, that my freedom is tied to money and what i can do with it all right now, with regards to the culture war, here what you're dealing with is my attitudes towards alcohol, sex, to some degree drugs, um, uh, leisure, and my freedom to choose. Now, again, a lot of this is going to be tied to the fact that there's a new normal, all right, in America. And that new normal is we fought a war and we don't necessarily buy into the old way of looking at, at it, all right, at looking at traditions, values, mores, all of that stuff. The old way of looking at things is out. In other words, we're going to redefine um, what the new normal is. And part of that new normal is going to be an embrace of modernism. All right. Um, and here you can talk about fashion, you can talk about art, you can talk about all that. And what you're going to get, like I said, with this culture war, all this stuff is going to be embraced by the liberals, right? The conservatives, on the other hand, are going to rebuke it, all right? And this rebuke, in a lot of ways, tied to religion, it's tied to the past, and in many cases, it's tied to the fact that that new is not best, all right? And, and in many ways, and this is a constant theme of the course, the status quo prior to 1914 is okay, all right? It's, it's this new status quo they don't like, all right? This is a new status quo, and these guys right here don't like it. And um, this conservatism, um, again, is a tie to rebuke, and this rebuke is going to be tied to how people dress, act, um, 
education, um, the view of the government, um, the view of the sacrifices to World War I. And again, this liberalism of embracism and modernism, you could probably start talking about um, the lost generation if you wanted to. I know there's a lot of, a lot of stuff here on chapter 20. This, this question four, um, you can really go to town on it. All right, so that's that one. Let's turn our attentions to chapters 21 <clears throat> and 22. So, all right, so here's what you got. Um, here on chapter 21, question one, you're dealing with Hoover, right? And what you're basically looking at is Hoover, the president, what you got there, you have volunteerism. So what you want to do is tell me who Hoover, right? You want to discuss a little bit about his attitude. You want to tell me what he had in mind um, in this volunteerism. And then you want to talk, a bit, talk to me about why it failed. All right, so you have a lot of things going on. Now, Hoover the president right he's a quaker he believes in pulling yourself up by the bootstraps right he is real big on hard work and he's over optimistic about the united states and its potential now this volunteerism is in many ways tied to his quakerism so you want to basically say Help thy neighbor. And you want to keep the government out of it. And this is key because he's, he's, he's arguing that all the problems that are created by the Great Depression, which you can talk about, because this is the overarching theme, right, is the fact that it all starts at the local and state level, right? Try to resolve your problems here without getting the government involved. And it's the spirit of, comp of volunteerism that's going to get us through all this. All right. Now, this sounds great on, on paper, but the thing is, the nation is in trouble. Um, and you have... One out of four people unemployed. You have no safety net. In other words, there was no real wealth that these people could tap into. The poor couldn't help the poor. So that love thy neighbor um, and help thy neighbor as thyself is um, out the window. And you really have a government that was asleep. Um, it, it's just... There were just not enough help, and they weren't willing to risk freedoms that America enjoys by exerting too much government control. All right. So, in other words, this lax oversight. Yeah, while it worked before, now it's not good. All right, and people lose hope, and they lose. Um, that sense that their government is um, on their side. All right. So again, you have all kinds of stuff um, that you can talk about it. Right. And again, break your question up into pieces and then just go for it. All right. And again, this is just a brief overview on this one. Okay. Um, question two on chapter 22. Uh, chapter 21, question two. Now, <clears throat> again, you're going to talk about relief programs. You're going to talk about the New Deal. And 
and what you want to talk about um, is what they were meant to do and what their limitations are. So you essentially got four pieces here. Now, I what I would say you can do right away is talk about the New Deal. Tell me about FDR, talk about his hope, talk about an active government. All right, so you set the table by talking about the New Deal, FDR, hope, active government. Um, you want to talk about um, the fact that the old ways of governing are out, all right? And this comes from FDR's experience as a governor. All right, so what were the relief programs? All kinds of programs that you can talk about. And in this case, what you're looking at is alphabet programs designed to bring relief, all right? And you could talk about at least six of these core programs, all right? And remember, they were designed to bring relief, but not be permanent, all right? And, and this, is, this is huge, because what's gonna happen is, post-World War II, when we finally get to that part, politicians are going to politicize these and then they're going to turn around and use these programs to get votes from people because they want to shape their behavior. All right. Now, when you get to your achievements, um, talk about hope. Um, talk about uh, an active government. Right. There's just some of the most simplest things. Um, it brought hope. Um, it brought government action. Um, it shaped public opinion for the most part. Um, it made FDR a hero to a lot of people. Um, but when you really get down to it, the numbers of all these programs basically say that it's not working, even after all this. And then, of course, the limitations are going to come in the form of the Supreme Court basically saying that the programs are unconstitutional. You're going to have liberals, for the most part, they're going to say it's not uh, progressive enough in the release of the poor. Um, it's just not working because the scope of the Great Depression is vast and it's damaging. All right. And again, I, I still argue, as, as many other, other politicians do, um, it was World War II that got us out of it. All right. So again, this gives you a framework of pretty much everything you could talk about with regards to this. So that's question number two. Um, here, again, I encourage you um, to look at your class notes here. And it, in many cases, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I kind of overdid it in this one in the sense that um, these major criticisms I talked about up here, um, and I'll just outline these these real quick. What I would do is talk about who the critics are, right? And then talk about their accuracy, right? Um, and again, you can talk about the critics being liberals, you can talk about the rich. You can talk about the Supreme Court. Um, you can also talk about progressives, which in many cases were um, liberals for all practical purposes. These are all people that basically say that either one, your actions as present were illegal. The rich were say these taxes and these programs, you're taking stuff from us and you're giving it to the poor. So they're not happy about that. Um, they actually say that FDR was a, uh, a traitor to his class. And then of course the liberals are going to criticize him and say that his programs aren't doing enough, right? In other words, you're helping the middle class but the poor are the ones um, 
that aren't directly benefiting. And then the progressives, and here you can talk about Howie Long and Robin Hood. Um, you can talk about Upton Sinclair. Um, you can talk about um, just about anybody that was a liberal, but then also somebody that's saying that the government wasn't going too far. And again, as this accuracy goes, it just boils down to this. You could talk about any one of the programs, all kinds of money being spent, but little relief. In other words, people aren't doing any better. All right. And you can also talk about the fact that the Supreme Court talked about the illegality of it all. Um, and again, it's money spent, little relief. Supreme Court says it's illegal. And then the numbers um, basically dictate, um, basically um, say that you're failing. All right. It's, it's not working. It's just the numbers are not there. And all of this is going to be used by his critics. All right. All be going to be used by his critics. Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Now, this one right here for chapter 21, in some regards, is um, largely somewhat of a repeat in some of the stuff I've said ab above in 2 and 3. So what you want to focus on is the role, talk about the role. You want to talk about FDR, and you can talk about the factors in any one of these three, right? So talk about the fact that you have a government that's going from inactive to active, and this is an economic social and political realms, right? You have a president that rebukes the past actions of Hoover, Coolidge, and Harding. In other words, I am not willing to sit on the sidelines and let my nation fail. I'm going to do whatever I can to use the three, um, the three branches of the government to the betterment of the people. Right? You are dealing with an activist president. Right? He's going to throw the full weight of his office towards fixing these problems, and these factors. Um, again, it's just you got the Great Depression. You have public opinion that's favorable. Um, so you have an emergency. You have the active, you have the fact that the, the public is behind you. And you have a president that's willing to take risks. And it's all kind of a part of this um, activism that I'm talking about with regard to FDR. Um, and you also have the fact that he has Congress, for the most part, he has both houses in his pocket, right? He, he's, he's working for, working um, with an activist of um, Congress that's willing to go along with all this. Um, and, and again, it's just, they got to do something and they're going to do it, all right? So that takes that. Let's, let's finish this, this off. Um, let's see here. Chapter 22. Um, discuss why most Americans were reluctant to get into World War II. Be sure to discuss how this impacted its content policy. Okay. Um, here, this reluctance... is due to the fact of our holdovers from World War I, the 1920s, and the Great Depression. We are in many cases in the midst of a slumber. In other words, 
we don't want to get in the middle of someone else's mess. Um, and it's because we really don't see where our mess has been fixed. Now, this reluctance, again, kind of goes back to chapter 19. It's historic. And again, you can talk about George Washington. You can talk about the Monroe Doctrine. But you can also say, to a large extent, we made a lot of money off of selling war, but we don't like the price that we paid by serving in the war. Now, that's not an overarching theme, but I will say this. It's kind of hypocritical. We say we stand up for democracy in Western civilization, but an overarching theme is if we end up being a part of it, why not sell stuff to support the war, but not actually serve in the war? And of course, that's all going to change because of Pearl Harbor, um, and that, that just really ramps it up. Now, remember with this reluctance, make sure you remind the, um, the reader that 80% of public opinion said stay out, right? Um, and that's, that's huge, all right? Um, now, with regards to FDR, what you need to understand is he has to balance between domestic policy and farm policy. He's got to deal with a Great Depression, but he also has to deal with the idea that he knows that England and France need help. And it's especially in lieu of Hitler and fascism. All right. He understands the dangers of all this, but at the same token, he really doesn't have anything to pull us towards this war um, with, re with regards to congressional support, right? You've got to remember Congress is basically uh, hogtied him. He, they're basically holding him back. All right, so that takes care of a question one. All right, let's take... Um, see, question two. Why did Roosevelt and many others believe it was necessary to block German and Japanese expansion? In um, many ways, this expansion is being blocked because it's tied to fascism. It's also tied to the notion of imperialism. And this imperialism is basically the belief that, yeah, if you're going to go out into the world, you do it economically for the benefit of open markets. But if it's imperialism and this colonialism is done under fascism, you really aren't giving everybody open um, access to um, to the uh, world and again you look at the overtures of both the Japanese and German they did it their way and um, there was no um, freedom or no negotiations all right now as far as US involvement this all comes down to um, FDR again and what FDR is going to do is he's going to establish a cash and carry program. And that is where he sells stuff to our Western allies without actually coming right out and saying where they're supporting them. Um, and it's military equipment, it's food, it's all that. Um, he starts to make overtures to the military that, hey, you better um, get your uh, act together, um, even though in short of money and materials, we basically got to start looking like we're going to get ready. And one of the other items I would add in here, Churchill. Um, it's his relationships with Churchill um, that kind of put us on a war footing. All right? you, you can't stop Churchill from writing letters. You can't stop Churchill from uh, talking on the phone. Um, yeah, he, he pretty much knew 
that he's going to engage his State Department in the future planning of the war, um, and he's getting his people ready um, for this. All right. Um, here, this right here, in many ways, um, I would have to say is a residual of this. So um, what you're basically looking at is go ahead, um, in some regards, you can take this question, talk a little bit about this, and what you can go after with this question is look at what you said in question two. And here, what you're going to do is FDR is going to start looking at ways to release funds for the war effort. And it's going to be shaped in domestic policy. All right. He is going to look at ways that we use the war board in World War One. Um, and again, these are just all these things he's going to do to get us ready for the war. All right. And it's money towards the war effort shaped in domestic policy. He's going to um, start looking at forming war boards as it relates to World War One. Um, he's going to use his State Department as listening post um, to world problems. And, and again, he's going to use his relations with Great Britain and France um, to kind of pepper things. And another thing is he's going to use, try to use public opinion um, carefully. And when I say that carefully, he knows he can't fight this war without getting um, public opinion behind it. All right. And, and I've said this in class. Um, he may have been shocked by Pearl, the damage of Pearl, but in the same token, he's going to use Pearl as a pretext um, to get us into the war. And without actually going and looking at his letters prior to December 7th and then when it happened and afterwards, I can't imagine that as much as he was supporting the war effort to defend Great Britain and France, that this wasn't a relief that something happened that allowed him to advance us towards war. All right. Um, let's take a look at number four. Here, what I want you to do um, is go back and look at that sheet I gave you. Go back and look at that sheet. Uh, there's four reasons why to drop the bomb. All right. And, um, just go to those four reasons and you just have a plethora of, of information to talk about his decision. Then you can talk about science and technology. And this is key because here what you can do is you can talk about the splitting of the atom, right? You can also talk about the Nazis and their war plans. And then you can talk about Einstein and his letter. And then you could talk about um, our Manhattan Project. All right. It's just, it's, a, it's kind of like a, um, a domino effect. The splitting Nazi war plans, Einstein's letter led to the Manhattan Project. And then at the end of the end of the day, you have two bombs, and that is what are you going to do with them? All right, what are you going to do with them? Um, and of course, number five, um, 
all kinds of stuff there. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Um, you're, you're talking about the Holocaust. Um, you're, you're talking about the Holocaust. Um, in Nazi Germany and support and your uh, surrounding European nations, um, what you basically want to do here is with this Holocaust, you want to go back to my lecture notes where I talk about what happened in Europe in in pre 1933. All right, you want to talk about how anti-Semitism was historic. Right? You want to talk about the fact that it was universal. And you also want to talk about the fact that it was intense. In other words, there were prior events. So what you have is events that drove this thing prior to what was going on. And then, of course, you have these refugee crises. And then how 27 nations basically said, we're not going to take them off your hands. Um, and then you have the mechanism itself, um, that allowed him to do it, right? Technology and science, all right? It, these are all things that are going to lead to 6.5 million people, um, being killed, all right? So there you have it. Just, um, a lot of good stuff on all of these. All right, so... Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to download this and get this in your hands. Um, and good luck uh, getting your notes together. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.